So I think we'll proceed to the our next segment. Yeah, good afternoon. Hope everyone is awake after a very sumptuous lunch. And so we are going to start with the basics of, uh, and I have been told to talk about the sterilization of laparoscopic instruments. It's a vast topic. I bring greetings from Kanpur, Uttar Pradesh. I am Dr. Shivanshu Mishra. And <coughs> um, so these are my disclosures. I am a medical consultant to Merrill Lotus, and I am the editorial board member for General of Bariatric Surgery, General of Minimal Access Surgery, and Indian General of Surgery. So the, what is sterilization is the complete elimination or destruction of all the forms of microbial life by either physical or chemical process, OK? And when the survey was conducted, at, and if you were to go uh, laparoscopic surgery yourself, so what was the poll that people had told was that it was uh, most of them opted for an autoclave, then few of them ETO, and few, very less of them had the formal dehyde or the glutaral dehyde sterilization. So minimal access surgery is all, not, it's, it's much more than cosmesis. It's, it's about the safety and the sterility, of course. And for that, sterilization of the laparoscopic instrument is of utmost importance. So how do we do it right? Hmm. Laparoscopic instruments, as compared to the open instruments, have different uh, that hmm. crevices. Okay. They have the blood oh. and tissues enter that through the capillary action and there is lodging of the some bio uh, burden. So we have to properly clean it first. So what is important before sterilization is the proper physical cleaning of the instruments. And as we all know, the sterilization, as I told, is the elimination of all the forms of uh, microorganisms, be it the enveloped viruses, which has a very low shelf life, to the prions and the spores, which have a quite a long shelf life and they don't usually go off very easily. So we have to have a stringent protocol for laparoscopic sterilization. As we all know, sterilization begins with when we clean the instruments either by a normal tap wash and then we dismantle them and then we clean by the normal brushes. We have to make sure that the sheath does not go off and we have to debulk the organic and the inorganic load and <coughs> depending upon the uh, type and pH, we have to then clean, uh, keep the uh, instruments for sterilization. Then there's the spalding classification of the surfaces that we have to know as theoretical, that there are the critical, there are semi-critical and there are the non-critical objects and <coughs> objects which are actually entering the vascular uh, normal sterile tissue or the vascular system, they actually require sterilization and not the high level dis infection or the disinfection of any sort of that category. So sterilization basically of uh, three to four types. One is the mechanical method, then the physical method and the chemical method. The me mechanical method is simply the scrubbing and Sakarne. filtration sedimentation and the Sakarne. physical Sakarne. methods combines the heat, moist heat, dry heat, sunlight and radiation. I know it's very quite a dry topic and everybody would be aware of that. But it's my job to bring forth towards you all these important things and what you should carry toward to your home. And the heat, moist heat can be below 100 uh, degrees centigrade, at 100 and more than 100 degrees centigrade. Then dry heat can be by hot air oven, incineration, flaming, sunlight, all these things. And then the uh, non-ionizing radiations can be of UV rays and the ionizing ra radiation can be through X-ray and gamma rays. Then there are other uh, things like uh, uh, ETO and then the uh, parasitic acid and the radiation for the industrial use for sterilization. Mm -hmm. So coming to the moist uh, sterilization, the most important is the autoclave. Everybody here would be aware of autoclave. Yes, definitely everybody would be using autoclave. It's steam under pressure, 121 to 132 degrees centigrade for some amount of time. And then it is usually for around 50 minutes to 60 minutes depending upon the time. and advantages of the uh, autoclave is it's non-toxic, it's quite easy, it's cheap, it's not very expensive as compared to ETO or the other uh, other sterilization uh, techniques. It uh, We can uh, properly and uh, we have a rapid cyclical time and it has a good efficiency of uh, I would say sporicidal activity if, if done properly and <coughs> it is least affected by the organic and inorganic uh, uh, soils. Okay, and the, what are the disadvantages? It is not good for the heat labile instruments. It can cause rusting of the instruments and it may have some burns if not handled properly. 
dry sterilization it's same like the uh, autoclave but again with a bigger uh, more of amount of heat and more cycle uh, the cycle time is longer okay it's around 16 hours and even the load capacity is even smaller so lower temperature sterilization it's uh, it is important for the temp uh, moisture sensitive uh, instruments and uh, then we can use the in in these sort of cases we can use the formaldehyde it is an alternative a good alternative to eto but again it has uh, means it produces some gaseous uh, materials and it is sometimes toxic and we can uh, also you uh, means always use this for the heat labile, labile uh, materials like plastics and non flexible endoscopes and in, uh, equipments eto ladies and gentlemen again it's a very good equipment it costs around 4.5 to 5 lakhs in from a standard company it it does not occupy that much of a space and it is very handy and uh, to tell in the practical aspect it's one of even when you using the uh, if you are in case you are using a, a, a means viral marker positive case like hbs ag hcv hiv yeah. it is always important that you have to have this eto done uh, for the instruments it is odorless and it is definitely used for a heat labile instruments and can pro, uh, and can prevent the rusting and all but it has definitely a smell of ether something like that and uh, the mechanism of action is that it directly attacks the dna and uh, to go inside the n positions of the guanine uh, particle and it is definitely carcinogenic oh, and mutagenic and it has some professional nah, hazards associated uh, with it so that's why a good amount of aeration time is uh, required uh, for this patient for the, when we use the eto and it takes a, it ranges from around 8 to 24 hours and uh, it's again easily available it is i would say a, a good setup should definitely have a eto equipped apart from the autoclave and uh, <laughs> does not require high temperature or humidity or pressures and it, it has a good penetra penetration capability it is non corrosive the dis the main disadvantage is professional hazards it's carcinogenic and it has lengthy cycle and aeration time now next is the uh, steroid it's it's even more expensive than eto the concept is that the h2o2 vapors are uh, put up in the electrical field and they uh, then they, when they, uh, the hydroxyl and the hydroxyperoxyl free radicals are produced, it disrupts the cell membrane and nucleic acid, so it causes a cell death. And once the electrical field is off, then again it turns into H2 and wat water, and the, so the byproducts are not carcinogenic. Okay, in this steroid, and it's it's very very highly efficacious in this aspect as well. So advantages again, non-toxic products are there. The cyclical time is not as high as ETO. It is just from 55 to 75 minutes and just like a uh, uh, mini autoclave and then there is no aeration time because in ETO we required to take out the toxic things and carcinogen we need an aeration time in steroid we don't need any aeration time okay disadvantage it is very expensive and <coughs> and it is not used for linens or powder or liquid and it even at the slightest moisture it will just turn off so we have to make this environment totally dry for when we, if we use a steroid formalin chamber everybody knows but uh, whether we use it, I know even I use it, when I, most of you use it, but again whether it is how many uh, formalin balls to use and how much is the expo proper exposure time and now many studies have shown that formalin chamber should not be used as a proper this thing uh, for sterilization purpose. Even if it is used, it should be used at least for 24 hours to 48 hours when we use the formalin chamber. Coming to the liquid chemical sterilant and disinfectants, it is only for the heat sensitive and critical instruments and it has, it can produce the toxic chemicals and it can again cause the professional hazards. So most commonly used are aqueous formaldehyde and it's among the oldest as we all know uh, uh, chemicals that we are using, it has a pungent order. The next is the uh, deuteraldehyde, it is more rapid and, is, and it is less irritating to the than the formaldehyde and it has minimum we should use it for 10 hours and it, the instruments should be properly rinsed for a, to, 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 be, uh, to be properly sporicidal and properly uh, dis, uh, means ster sterilized. Coming to the other methods are like ga gamma radiations in which we use the cobalt 60 source is used and the ultraviolet uh, light. Ultraviolet is basically for the surface uh, uh, sterilization not 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 for the deep penetration and the penetration capacity is quite poor it is used for sterilize uh, sterilizing the glasses grafts and the blades then so most important thing that we have to understand is the heat tolerant endoscopes and accessories usually steam sterilization is the first choice 
and if it is the uh, instruments are uh, sensitive then ETU or gas plasma or steroid can be used and if there is insufficient time then yes at least 2% glutaraldehyde for 25 minutes minimum before you change to the uh, for the next case. Always make sure the clean cases should be done first like the hernias and the clean contaminated or contaminated should be done in the second or third rounds respectively. So there is always an ideal disinfectant which the search is going on. And uh, most important thing is that without uh, the after the sterilization is the packaging which I will not I am not uh, here to talk about that because I have been given only 8 minutes to talk. And packaging is again very important how we have to pack how much what is the packets and then what are the labels that we have to put we all have to have a proper biological indicator I'll be talking about that so I'm not going to talk about the packing and the loading storage and uh, how much it should be there and then I'll just come to quickly come to yeah sterilization monitoring it, it should be done in a regular uh, regular way by physical chemical or biological parameters most important is the bi biological when in which the bacillus spores are used to measure the sterilization and there is an internal uh, chemical indicator and followed th that that should not be turning into black and that should be done every weekly once in a proper hospital institutional setup and uh, Usually in the Bowie Davis uh, tape is there in which the in which if we use the steam uh, sterilization bacillus uh, stereothermophilus is used if dry heat is used then bacillus atrophius is used and in case of ETO bacillus atrophius is again used and then that's it you have to do a proper record keeping and you have to do a regular quality check and thorough cleaning is important primary step and it is essential to follow the rigid protocols for instrument cleaning and sterilization. Only well established methods of sterilization and high level disinfection should be used and some current practices should be abolished totally if you totally rely upon these like formalin chambers definitely you should have a autoclave or at least a ETO in your hospital. And uh, what is the manufacture guidelines from each store if you are using car stores if you are using ohm whatever. So there is a specific guidelines from each instrument manufacturer you have to follow those protocols specifically for the uh, sterilization. So this is a small video, uh, voice is there. This is only about sterilize, um, how to do, you, how you do the packing after sterilization. Uh, video play over, uh, sound is there. Anyhow, uh, that was just about sterilization. Any doubts and cl uh, clarifications regarding sterilization, you may ask. Thank you. Sir, harmonic sample, you can uh, do it by either ways. It's, it's this, by ETU, you can do. Cheaper may. For, no, it means you can put in the chamber. Like again, as I told, formally in chamber, you can put. Usually, you put, but again, ETU is the best way uh, to this thing. Tackers, I, I reuse my tackers. I do not uh, means throw them after if, if I have 12, 15 fires and I am left with 15 fires. What I do is that I will suck them and clean the tip. Then I will fire one tacker and then keep it in the chamber. And if it is not, if the case is not there, if, of course that does not occur for too long. Tackers and staplers like Ethicon for Beritric and all, if you use that. You can keep that uh, means in the formula chamber in case a case comes within a week, you can use them at least 48, 24, 48 hours, let it be in the chamber. In case there is no case, set up one fine day in the practical aspect I am telling, I use, then I keep it in the ETO and then I do the sterilization for all these things. At least 10, 15 days once. Thank Any you. Any other questions? So thank you Dr. Mishra for the wonderful enlightening talk. Thank you sir. Dr. Prakhar Gupta is here. Ajay, you will do that. I think Dr. Vikram. Vikram can come and tell us about laparoscopy in a small setup, how to make it safe and cost effective. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, laparoscopy in small setup, how to make it safe and cost effective. It's a kind of uh, philosophical topic actually and uh, uh, it expects a, a bit of discipline from us. So why Sumanth has given me this topic is because uh, uh, I run this small hospital, it's a 5 bedded hospital where I started my uh, practice 
around four years back now I'm uh, moving to that hospital and I work, I work as a freelancer so uh, he knows that I uh, the difficulties of running a small hospital so in any, in any hospital safety comes first if it is a small setup if the answer is yes you should be extra cautious because safety is responsibility of each and everyone in the team so important uh, i'll cover few important safety considerations the practical aspects so uh, we should be wise enough to select the patients and uh, we should uh, assess the risk of the patient on our results before giving it to anesthesia friend S try to select uncomplicated cases initially use your uh, clinical skills we are we are all like graduated and also did post graduation so we should use our skills we should ask repeated history like how many times you had pain before going for uh, appendicectomy or colostectomy and you should not miss any uh, previous surgery questions like uh, so that uh, uh, that can help us in selecting the cases and involve your anesthesiologist friend it's not like he, he will directly come to your theater and he'll put a tube and you'll start putting the port okay involve your anesthesiologist friend before selecting the patient in this risk, risk assessment the dictum i follow is if you could send one patient safely home he or she will bring another patient there is one quotation from ramesh ardhanari the surgical gastroenterologist he says that even if the patient dies and if you handle the death very well he will bring another patient okay so uh, i i got inspired from him and i got one patient uh, after uh, from an a dead patient and in theater mind the position of the patient you should pad the patient very well i did a sebaceous excision and patient had a cautery burn the sebaceous scar healed in 10 days but uh, cautery burn took 3 weeks okay so we should pad the patient well we should mind the patient position well and another thing before shifting the patient to ot itself you should check the equipment you switch on the laparoscopy set everyone every every unit monitor encephalator light source camera processor check yourself with your eyes that it is working and check the function of energy sources in a small setup usually we'll have a monopolar and bipolar cautery so switch it on and see that whether it is functioning or not and check the suction operators it doesn't take much time just switching on everything and checking that and check the anesthesia machine also we should learn to check the anesthesia machine because anesthetists do change different people will come in different occasions so we need to learn the fact that we should be able to check the anesthesia machine also because i had difficulty once and you should check the availability of gases also so we don't mind in a corporate setup we don't mind about uh, is the availability of when i come in and operate it in the morning i, I never ask this like uh, is there oxygen is there nitrous oxide is there carbon dioxide no need to ask here but in a small setup you should check the level and backup of these three oxygens if you want to do a laparoscopy then coming to the cost effectiveness this is this is a common question you'll get in in mind after uh, passing out and getting a degree so you want to buy a lab set so what set you should buy is it a new set or is or should we have to go for a refurbished one to uh, get the economy on track i'm standing as an example i bought a new set of about 20 lakhs and uh, in 3 months i got the light source failed same thing can apply to refurbished thing so it's about uh, service thing it's not about like uh, it doesn't mean that if you spend good amount of money you'll have all good things so you should check every system before starting the case keep a backup if you if you are around like if your friend is around and if he could give you a, a uh, light source or camera if it fails in your setup then that's that's a good thing so you should maintain good relationship with your surgeon friends usually we don't do that when we uh, start uh, clinical practice in the small villages and uh, good energy sources i i began my practice with a uh, simple ln monopolar and bipolar cautery and later i bought uh, harmonic and uh, i am uh, planning to buy ligasure also so there is always uh, we can follow step up approach we can upscale gradually once we our revenues are getting corrected coming to the starting of the case after good induction and you have all good oxygen nitrous and uh, co2 and uh, you are starting the case 
the first step is safe creation of pneumoperitoneum. So whenever you are starting, you will have all the pressure of completing the case while putting the first port. While accessing that pneumoperitoneum, you will have the pressure in the initial days. Okay, so we should be very, very careful in getting pneumoperitoneum. We should create it very safely. Approach is your choice and your training. It, it depends on your training. Be it various needle, be it Hassan's technique, whatever you are comfortable, you can do anything. Um, traditionally, Hassan's technique is being followed many times, but we are trained in uh, various needle most of the times. And mind the scarred abdomen. Mind the scarred abdomen. Stay away from scars. And of course, there are, uh, you can read a lot of Palmas point, Jain point, so many safe points are there for entry, but uh, we, should, we should create a safe pneumoperitoneum. And before, after putting the pneumoperitoneum directly, don't go to the gallbladder and put the other ports. Try to look for injuries. Look for injuries wherever you are entering. You have seen Sandeep sir in the morning and the caution he has given after placing the very needle that has went into uh, momentum. So we should check the entry point before proceeding the actual surgery. And intra-abdominal pressure, I have seen uh, in other setups, uh, people keep it 16 and flow at 10. That's not good. So keeping the pressure below 12 mm will be good for safety of patient. So try to keep it 15 if, the, if you feel that insufflator is not working and preferably work on at the level of 12 millimeters of mercury. Most of the complications in laparoscopy occur during port placement. That means 50% of the complications occur during port placement. This is the one example where we could see injury of the left uh, inferior epigastric artery. So we should try to place the ports under vision. Good vision is always better. Try to go for uh, good chip cameras and don't compromise on the vision. If the camera system is not working, change it and deny, the, deny a surgery if you are a freelancer. And if you are if you are in the middle of surgery and if you are in a very tense moment and if the vision is blurred, don't keep on doing the surgery. You take some breath out, keep the lens clean. I have seen like some people continuously doing even if the scope blurs. Sterilization, that part uh, uh, this gentleman has converted, has uh, covered. Convert our call. Don't hesitate to uh, like uh, convert. Though laparoscopy surgery is advanced, still open surgery is a gold standard one. So we need to send the patient home safely. So don't hesitate to convert it if safety, if you feel, is getting compromised and if you are prolonging and that may affect the patient in the ICU. Don't hesitate to call for help. And there is always scope for improvement. Like if you, if you can't do the, complete the laparoscopy surgery today, you can select a good case next time and you can complete the case. Okay, we can always do better in next case. Intracorporeal suturing, coming to the safe, uh, cost effectiveness, this one, this one I feel the most effective way to reduce the cost in laparoscopy surgery. So len endo suturing, not only lending and we should practice it almost daily. And come, you just a simple example is cost of tackers versus sutures. Okay, so suture, it costs hardly 400 or 500 if it at the level of uh, purchasing, uh, leave about MRPs. I know the, the difference between MRPs and this one. The purchase of suture hardly costs about 400 or 500 tackers comes around 18,000. Okay, so, but many people are using barbed suture, but still barbed sutures are costly at 1,800 to 2,400. So, if you observe these all companies, you know, these uh, all MNC companies, they bank on our laziness. We can, we, we have seen we, we are, uh, in the morning that we can put the mesh, that's a regular mesh. And what is the need of 3D meshes and self-expandable mesh if your skill is good enough? The companies do bank on our laziness and on our less skills. So if you are becoming more skillful, we can uh, reduce the cost. And one more thing, every year, the cost of equipment, whatever the pu we purchase, will increase by 10% if you observe. The same equipment I bought four years back costs around 40 lakhs now. So they'll increase 10% every year. Whereas our salaries and also the patient payment capacity is coming down every year. Okay? Yes. Jugard is a word that is being uh, increasingly used for the past 2019 that has been given Oxford Dictionary name also, okay? So we have uh, seen that uh, many creative ideas. Before closing, the abdomen and also my talk, check for gauze pieces, check for needles, check for endo covers and also check for tissue pieces. Don't just ask sister, sister, as, uh, gauze out, 
Don't, uh, don't just ask and leave. Check with your eyes. Check with your I have uh, one, one experience. I asked sister that, is needle out? Yes. But when I found out that the needle is there in the port in the next surgery. Okay, so we should check with our eyes. Good luck. Thank you. Any questions? Very practical. Very, very practical and very enlightening. Thank you. No further questions then, I think then we can move to our next topic. Dr. Prokhar Gupta will be giving a talk on the energy sources in laparoscopy. Know it before you use it. So, uh, <coughs> good afternoon everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Prakhar. I will be speaking about energy sources in laparoscopy. So, with the advancement in the technologies, we are now able to complete even the most complex procedures safely and laparoscopically. So, the history dates back to 18th century, but it was only in 1926 when these two gentlemen, Dr. Harvey Cushing and Bowie, used the first electrosurgical generator for a neurosurgery. From then till now, we have come a long way. The units which we have nowadays are actually intelligent. They have a processor in them which senses the current as well as it uh, stops it whenever not required. So it has led to safety and precision and same time it has enabled us to do uh, even the most complex cases uh, laparoscopically. So the types of energy that are available with us are electrical energy in the form of monopolar and bipolar, uh, the mechanical energy in the form of harmonic and light energy in the form of lasers. So before moving on to uh, the energy sources themselves, uh, we'll first have a look at what effect the, does the heat have on cells. So at 37 degrees Celsius is the normal temperature, uh, at 60 to 90 degrees Celsius uh, coagulation and desiccation occurs. At 100 degrees Celsius, the cells are converted into steam and they burst. At 200 degrees Celsius, uh, charring occurs. So coming on to the most commonly used energy source in our uh, routine cases, that is monopolar. So as the name suggests, uh, this monopolar uh, means that there is an elective electrode in the hand of the surgeon, while the other electrode is actually attached to the patient's body. So the patient is a part of the circuit and therefore, there is an inherent risk of energy while applying this, uh, while, uh, risk of injury while applying, applying this uh, energy. Uh, but the good thing is that these are very versatile as practically any instrument in our uh, operation theatre can be converted into a monopolar energy source. All the uh, monopolar energy sources, they have two color pedals, that is yellow and blue. Uh, what is the difference between them? Uh, so the difference is, uh, the way the current flows while pressing these pedals. So while pressing the yellow pedal, uh, there is a continuous current that is of low voltage, which leads to very high temperature rapidly. So this causes cell burst and vaporization. While pressing the blue button, uh, there is an intermittent current of high voltage, uh, which leads to rise in temperature, but it is a gradual rise and not a rapid rise. So this leads to desiccation and coagulant formation. So there are several variables according to which uh, the effect on the tissue uh, is impacted. So first of all is the size of the electrode. The shorter the size of the electrode, higher is the current density. Uh, more the time, uh, if you are pressing the pedal, there will be more current delivery. Then the type of the tissue. So the tissue that has a higher water content will require lesser uh, power for uh, uh, coagulation. Then presence of HR on the instrument tips or at the tissue. So HR is a very, uh, has got a very high resistance. So that will require a lot of charring. So that is why it is advised whenever your uh, instruments are getting uh, charred, you need to clean them repeatedly during the case. Then comes the traction over the tissues. So if the tissues are under traction, there won't be any hemostasis. Rather, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to coagulate any tissue, uh, you have to get it relaxed and then apply the current. So coming to the injuries that occur during electrosurgery. Uh, this is actually the most uh, important part of this presentation. Uh, it, according, to a, uh, uh, according to a paper, about one to two cases in per 1000 surgeries have an uh, injury due to electrosurgery. 
these injuries can occur in any of these following uh, zones the zone 1 is the one which we see in the monitor zone 2 is the one which we don't see in the monitor zone 3 is injury because of the trocar so the zone 1 injury is the pilot error wherein because of uh, say poor hand eye coordination uh, uh, the surgeon he just touches the uh, organ which is not intended to be so that will lead to an injury also whenever we apply the current near metal objects like clips or staple lines it will lead to very fast uh, passage of the current through those metal clips and it will burn the tissues that are in contact with it second is the insulation failure so here we can see in this clip that a large part of this instrument is not visible so uh, suppose there is a breach in the insulation sheath and we are applying current so that current will pass to the uh, structure that comes in contact with that sheath and the bad part is that these injuries usually go unrecognized during the surgery and they are visible only after the patient comes in the follow up so how to prevent this so we have insuloscopes available but they are very costly another cost effective method is uh, that we can check using a magnifying glass uh, every sheath of every instrument before giving them for sterilization then is the conductive coupling this occurs when there is crowding of instruments especially while doing surgery in the pelvis or a narrow area so here uh, when there are too many instruments uh, some of the uh, instrument may get accidentally touched during uh, passage of the uh, current so this will lead to an injury then comes the capacitive coupling this is usually uh, not seen nowadays this was a problem when uh, we used to use uh, plastic trocars up, uh, outside the metal trocars so nowadays what happens is see this is uh, the uh, while passing the current the, there is an in inner metal which is uh, actually the active electrode outside it is a sheath uh, an insulator sheath and outside that is a trocar so while passing the current some current it gets stored in the trocar which is then uh, dissipated through the abdominal wall but suppose we are using a plastic trocar outside this then that current gets stored in the trocar and that trocar when it comes into contact with any intraabdominal tissue will uh, cause the injury then this is the most common uh, injuries that are seen because of electrosurg electrosurgery uh, the injuries at the return electrode so why do they happen they happen because of uh, inefficient seal of the return electrode to the patient body part or selection of the wrong body part so it is advised that we choose a well vascularized muscle mass and that area should have less of the adipose tissue uh, should not have any hair and it should not be near any bony prominence now coming on to the bipolar uh, energy this is a very safe form of energy as uh, shown in the diagram both of the electrodes are in the hand of the surgeon so we get the desired effect at the desired area uh, here the patient is not the part of the uh, circuit so there is no or very low risk of injuries and there is very less lateral spread spread but the problem with bipolar is that uh, it is not very versatile you need to have specialized instruments for using bipolar current and these uh, bipolar themselves are not able to cut the tissues so we have newer bipolar devices uh, like ligasure and inseal uh, they work on the uh, principle of bipolar plus pressure so this has a ai based sensing sensing system which adapts to the tissue resistance these seals uh, have a, uh, vessels of around 7 mm uh, they have a lateral spread of 4.5 mm now coming to the uh, another source of uh, energy which we use commonly nowadays that is the mechanical energy so this is harmonic which uses mechanical in, in, uh, energy and it converts into heat energy by piezoelectric effect the active electrode it vibrates at a very high rate of about 55000 per second these energy sources have minimal thermal spread and they are able to coagulate vessels of up to 5 mm and they are used to cut and coagulate simultaneously then this is thunder bead which is the latest one it is a hybrid machine uh, with ultra which works on the principle of uh, ultrasonic as well as bipolar it is used to dissect to coagulate and cut 
and it has got a fast cutting speed. So the key points for using uh, diathermy that is monopolar is that we have to use low power settings, uh, use bipolar whenever possible, use short bursts of current rather than continuously uh, pressing the pedals and invest in a good ESU which has a good processor in it. Uh, you should not use the uh, cautery in open circuit that is uh, you should press the pedal only when it is required. It should not be used near metal clips. Uh, you should always check the instruments for insulation and the hybrid trocar system should not be used. For any of the advanced cases, any, uh, any, any one of these can be used that is Liga Shore or Harmonic or a Thunderbeat. So in the end I would like to say that uh, our OT is like this cockpit where for safe surgery you need to know each and everything about every equipment that, are you, that you are using. Thank you. Any questions? And thank you, Dr. Prakar Gupta. Thank you, sir. We move on to our next, which is basic in advanced laparoscopy. Am I ready? Basic to, basic to advanced laparoscopy. Dr. Rudrajit Sena will be speaking on this. Hello, good evening. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to attend LWSK. Difficult acronym to remember, but. Um, it's really a very good uh, organization by Dr. Shumanta Dev. I'm seeing Dr. Obishek. I've done my residency with him, both superb surgeons. So can I, is it on? I can't see it on screen. So the question is basic to advanced laparoscopy and am I ready? Uh, this has got to do as much with skills as with your own confidence because some people will say, that I'm never ready, and some people will start doing advanced laparoscopy without the subsequent training. Is it on? Because it's on over here. So while they're setting this up, I just came in when Dr. Vikram was giving his last bit about checking everything before you go out of the abdomen. So I remember once I was assisting him in GEM and uh, we were juniors at that time. So we had an appendix, appendix to do and he completed the operation as well as he does in half an hour. And then he, I saw him very perturbed. I said, what is happening? And I was the cameraman over there. So what he did was that he had put in a uh, gauze piece and the gauze piece was cut and there were some threads dangling from that gauze piece. And then he was not too sure whether one thread little bit was inside or not. And then it was late in the day, so it was at 4.35 and I was just telling him, okay, go on, come on, come on, come on. I said, no, no, let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. And after 15 to 20 minutes, he just found this small piece of thread which had detached itself from the from the gauze and was in the abdomen. So that is something I got, I learned from him. Uh, okay, so basic to advanced laparoscopy, are you ready? So what is a basic laparoscopic surgeon? I have no idea what this term. Because I feel anyone who does a laparoscopy is an advanced surgeon by himself. So some principles has to be met. So how many of you think laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a very basic surgery in laparoscopy? Or an appendicectomy for that matter? This question, open question. Dr. Vikram? Huh? Vishivanshu? Prakar? Anyone? Obhishek? So this is the first learning that you have to do. You have to detach this from laparoscopic cholecystectomy appendix is a very basic surgery. It isn't. Because you have to use the same principles of advanced surgery that you have, like suturing, like tissue dissection in difficult cases. So this is the first point that you have to know. So what are the advanced skills that you should know before doing any laparoscopy? Forget basic and all. So first we say that suturing is very important. It is 
because unless you know your suturing very well, it is pointless to get inside the abdomen. Because even if that surgery does not have suturing per se, there might be some kind of a enteral uh, injury or some kind of a vascular injury which you have to, you know, little minor which you have to maybe deal with suturing. You don't want to call another surgeon who is very good and come and help you. Though that is advisable when you don't know how to do it. Next is tissue dissection, which is extremely important. By tissue dissection, I mean that you not need to have an excellent idea about anatomy about what you are holding by both hands. And by both hands is that if you want to become good in laparoscopic, and I'm not saying, not saying advanced laparoscopy, you have to use your left hand really well. So one of the first things that I learned in gem is to brush my teeth with my left hand. And I've injured a lot, but then I know what is control after that. The third thing that you have to know is about a space creation, especially when you're doing uh, TEP, that extraperitoneal procedures or ETEP. This is very important because you have to know which plane to go, identify the plane, how far to go, what are the endpoints, what are the landmarks. Very, very important. You know the knowledge of the anatomy. And of course, energy resources, which uh, Prakar said. And this is the most important, a bailout knowledge and what is the bailout procedure. Bailout means when you know that you are in trouble. Most of the injuries that happens in laparoscopy is when you don't know that you are in trouble. So it is very, very important for you to know when you are in trouble. It is very misleading when you see a lot of YouTube videos because surgeons will not put videos in which there is some injury, which is actually helpful to young, young surgeons or surgeons who are wanting to learn advanced, again, procedures. You have to know when to stop or when you are committing a crime per se. And if you have done that, how to get out of it. So it is pointless to do any kind of laparoscopy without knowing how to repair an enteral tear or you know, how to identify the blood vessel flowing right next to your energy source. Very, very important. So on that side, is not as much as skills, but as much of knowledge, what is there between your ears. So I always believe that for any kind of laparoscopic surgery, if you want to become known as a laparoscopic surgeon who is doing onco surgery, who is doing advanced uh, hernia surgeries, knowing you will do a better job laparoscopic than open. If you feel this particular patient will do better in your hands through open technique, do the open technique. Don't get into a pressure in which the patient has come to you and saying that, sir, I want to do laparoscopic. And you know that you will not be able to deliver best care to the patient laparoscopically. You'll give better care open. Don't fall into a pressure in which you're getting into a laparoscopic, get into a, get into a segment which you're not too sure of. So it is very important, always think from the patient and always think from your end. If you feel that, yes, I can do this better laparoscopically, Say, for example, in, uh, in oncology, if you can do uh, sort of a anterior resection better laparoscopically than open, then do laparoscopically. You are giving the best result for the patient. So when you know this, you are ready to be an advanced laparoscopic surgeon. Second is that you'll be a competent open surgeon. This is very, very important. Nowadays, young generation, they see more laparoscopic surgery. I don't think they see that much of open surgeries. But believe me, after, if, even if you've seen a lot of laparoscopic surgeries in your um, post-graduation, get yourself attached to a very good open surgeon. Because it is very important for you to do any kind of uh, advanced laparoscopic without knowing open. So open is not only your bailout technique, but you can offer, in some cases, laparoscopic, you can't proceed, you can switch to open. So that is very important. Respect your team and value their opinions. Develop a team. This is so important for any, not only laparoscopic, any kind of advanced surgery that you do. So you have to trust your team because that team actually helps you identify a lot of issues that can crop up in your surgery. Even multiple surgeries that you do, even, even if you've done 300 lap coles or, you know, uh, fund applications, impure technique creeps into your surgeries. So your team will correct you and give them enough confidence to correct it. It's very important. And also, ask help from a second surgeon. Very, very important. This is, again, a maturity that you'll have as you're doing more and more laparoscopic surgeries or any kind of surgeries. Don't 
you know, deny yourself a fresh insight, a fresh outlook of your surgery from the eyes of another surgeon. He can be your junior, absolutely. Or he can be your PGT. If he's in the second room, please come and ask and just see, see what, what, what's happening. Very, very important. And this is a very gen, gen I don't know what, what new term, this is a very deep your subject. It's continuous evolution. Be humble. Don't think that you have you've reached the peak. Continue to see other person's surgeries. Go through YouTube. Go through textbook. Because we, we have this entire you know, uh, thing that I, have, I, I know everything. I've done a laparoscopic uh, distal pancreatectomy, rasmectomy, and I know everything. It's very wrong. Okay? So that is very important. So once you know this slide very well, automatically the confidence will come. And of course, with practice and discipline, Shumanto, I've reached on time. You will become a very good, very good surgeon. So can anyone tell me what is the surgery that I'm doing? So this, again, my team was doing it in, um, in my hospital. So this is the sheath, anterior rectus sheath, beneath, and above is a subcutaneous tissue. So this is a scola that we were doing. Now this is something which is new. Do not attempt when you see these kind of surgeries in the net and you say, I must do this, it's very easy. Always have a good team. I did it with a senior of mine, he was there. This fund duplication, I think uh, Siddharth will take it tomorrow. Uh, this is again, uh, ventral hernia. Suturing technique is important. And in the end of my talk, I would just like to tell you, so I've come from the experimental scola to fund duplication to IPOM plus to last is laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Believe me, this is the most scary operation for most surgeons. Okay, so this is very, very important for you to identify, to know which are the anatomical planes, to know when you are going wrong, to know when you have to bail out, to define the anatomy, and if you cannot do any of these things, to um, do a subtotal. Your suturing is important. So all these things is very much important for you to keep in mind. And uh, lastly, the take home message in the advancement in any kind of lab, not advanced lab surgeon, advancement in lab, you need 50% skill, 50% discipline, and 100% attitude. And uh, this is very, very important for you to know. So this is my talk from basic to advanced laparoscopic. Am I ready? And you will be if you have discipline and skill. Thank you. Any questions? I don't think nobody, anybody is going to question the, you know, the sincerity of this talk. Thank you. I find, <laughs> it, find it very, very relevant and very topical in these days. Yeah, because Not getting too ahead of yourself. Hmm. Shumanto, anything? So, <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Shumanto, thank and Mohishek for thank the you. opportunity. Thank you. Rudrajit. Next is Tori. So we now move on to the our last topic, which is diagnostic laparoscopy, a must to start with. The talk to be given by Dr. Shumanto De. <coughs> so good afternoon everyone so my uh, topic of discussion is uh, a diagnostic laparoscopy and what is its important in your laparoscopy practice so if we consider the three most patient friendly uh, revolutions in the field of laparoscopic surgeries so they will be number one is anesthesia number two is asepsis and Definitely number three is, uh, will be uh, laparoscopy. So by definition, it's an MIS technique or minimal invasive surgical technique to diagnose intra-abdominal diseases. So what we can do by doing diagnostic laparoscopy? Inspect the larger surfaces with the intra-abdominal organs, take biopsy, cultures, do aspirations, do a lab ultrasonography uh, in deep organ parts if you have the facility, 
and definitely you do therapeutic intervention uh, if you are if you know the diagnosis <coughs> it started way back in 1901 when kelling inserted a cystoscope into the peritoneal cavity of a dog and instilled air to examine the abdominal contents it started all the story of laparoscopy started back then then swedish internist jacobius in the first did the diagnostic laparoscopy on human in 1910 so and gained popularity over the years but with the evolution of ct scan and mri the importance of diagnostic laparoscopy had a at sure at seen a dip but then still it has an immense importance in diagnosing and planning further management what are the present indications of doing diagnostic laparoscopy i think all laparoscopic surgeons should know how to do a proper diagnostic laparoscopy there are some methods of doing inspecting the abdomen and what are the conditions that you can do diagnostic laparoscopy diagnostic laparoscopy for if you are acute conditions in case of acute abdomen like it is abdominal trauma or in even in patients with uh, admitted in icu in very sick and you are suspecting some abdominal uh, pathology for the sickness in chronic conditions like chronic pelvic pain uh, most common cause of this is uh, in female is endometriosis then liver disease if you have to take some uh, <coughs> see the inspect the liver and take a biopsy from that under vision infertility in gynecological uh, diagnostic laparoscopy is very important role cryptorchidism if you want to see whether the where is the actual location of the intraabdominal uh, testis and definitely cox abdomen which is very prevalent in our country staging laparoscopy for cancer so these all cancers should be staged properly by doing diagnostic diagnostic laparoscopy at the beginning if you are suspecting some advanced disease whether it's locally advanced or metastatic so if you do a diagnostic laparoscopy you can definitely differentiate between the two and then take a call from there post cholecystectomy bile leak if you want to see whether it's a bile leak from you know it's a bile leak if bile draining uh, from the drain but if you don't know whether it's cystic duct stump leak or leak from the duct of lushka or some lateral tear from a cbd sometimes it's very difficult to uh, identify by doing mrcp or ct scan so if you can do a diagnostic laparoscopy at early stage very early in the leak period then you can definitely identify in case of <clears throat> bariatric surgery the leak bleed or any uh, uh, by resection anastomosis if there is suspecting some anastomotic leak the uh, advice is to go ahead early don't wait for too long go ahead do a diagnostic laparoscopy and the patient you can salvage the patient before the it gets uh, too bad and post operative intraabdominal collection you can see where is the actual collection you can sometimes the oculated collection can cannot be drained putting pigtail so you can go inside and drain give lavage so that is the immediate diagnostic laparoscopy in this situation can save patient's life and yours too so what are the advantage abdominal organs can be inspected abdominal cavity fluids can be taken for uh, some inspection or i mean uh, tests and samples taken uh, can be used for chemical cytological and bacteriological studies peritoneal lavage additional is already as said and therapeutic laparoscopy also so i'll come <clears throat> step by step so what are the anesthesia and ot setup is required preferably uh, diagnostic laparoscopy should be done under general anesthesia flexible ot table should be there because different phases of uh, diagnostic laparoscopy are inspecting the abdomen you need different patient positions so flexible ot table is needed for proper vision you need a hd vision system at least a 30 degree scope a recorder which can be recorded for the evidence purpose you can show to the patient uh, patient relatives also for further studies you can see this what are the actual findings were there energy sources should be there this basic monopolar and bipolar energy should be sources should be there so that in case of undue bleeding or something you can control with that and if you have harmonic or ligature with that that's a added advantage open set should always be ready sometimes uh, while doing diagnostic laparoscopy there are, can be some situation which can be very difficult to control by laparoscopy if you are not uh, that uh, good skills or the, that uh, good setup or that particular instrument that is missing or any such situation suppose a patient is deteriorating on table so without wasting time you can open so open set should be ready and a trained team in laparoscopy is absolutely required so 
these are images taken from my friend. So these are stab wound. You can see stab wounded patient's position in operating table. So the abdomen is exposed from jiffy sternum to the symphysis pubis and from lateral aspect uh, from the from table this side table to the other side of table. So all the abdominal so whole all the abdominal com uh, compartments or quadrants should be exposed properly. And abdominal access, how do you get to the abdominal access? There are different methods like viris or you can do open whichever you are comfortable. You can get access to the umbilical umbilicus or to the palmar's point but you should definitely away from the if there is any previous operative scar you should definitely stay away from that. And slow pneumoperitoneums and uh, in acute cases already if the patients are hypotensive and if you inflate the abdomen too quickly there will be uh, sudden cardiogenic shock or hypotensive shock should be, can be there. So slow inflation of the abdomen is uh, advised. So systemic plan of inspection for the upper abdomen. Patient should be in steep trendinal lumbar position. You start from the structure just below the umbilical. Suppose you got entry through the umbilical part. So after going inside you should see directly below from where you have put the first port. Okay. So after seeing that you see go on to the cecum and appendix part whether there is any pathology is there or not. Then to the right side of the ascending colon then up to the hepatic flexure. Okay. Next is change the to the reverse the Tendelenburg tilt. So right low of the gallbladder liver and the gallbladder should be examined properly if, if there is any suspicion you can take biopsy then to the telescope should be a little bit withdrawn and a little to cross the falciform ligament. So you retract the uh, uh, scope and to the on the other side on the left side of the falciform. So you see then the transverse colon then the left low of liver and spleen then the descending colon. So you have to change the patient position according to the right up to the left up depending upon the quadrant you are seeing. Okay. Then walk over to the whole of the small intestine. We say it, we call it bowel walk. So at least a non-tooth bowel grasper, uh, bowel grasper or non-tooth forceps, a non-tooth uh, grasper should be there to do the whole bowel walk from DJ flexure to the ileocecal junction. Coming to the pelvis, patient position again should be changed to the steep trendel number position. And full length of fallopian tube should be examined. Now first you should uh, examine the uterus, then the anterior cul de sac, then the round ligament and the full length of the fallopian tube should be inspected. So if you are seeing anything suspicious like endometriotic tissue or you suspect in TB or something, you can take biopsy from there. So this is a laparoscopic view of a stab wound with significant bleeding from the anterior abdominal wall. And there is a stab wound on the gastric wall which was actually not detected on CT scan on, and laparoscopic closure is done. So these are small uh, stab wounds and sometimes it is very, radiologists cannot actually identify if there is not uh, very experienced radiologists, they, sometimes they can miss this small stab wounds and uh, in the stomach or some small bowel. So if it is neglected or if it is kept like that, uh, there will be severe peritonitis and patient will day by day it will deteriorate and you will never know where, which is the actual source. So if you, in that situation when the diagnosis is in doubt, so go ahead with the diagnostic laparoscopy. If you can see there is nothing much to do, just close the rent. So as early as you close the rent, there is less chance of contamination of the abdomen and patients will be doing well. You can see the laparoscopic closure of the stab injury of the small bowel which was actually not detected in the CT. Coming to the uterus, you can see the fallopian tubes. The left fallopian tubes you can see, the pyosulfings or hydrosulfings something is there. Then the next slide I would like to show this one. You can see the pel pelvic cavity is fully studded with the tubercles. Okay. This can be tuberculosis, this can be uh, metastatic deposits, you never know. You can take biopsy and see afterwards. This is definitely endometriotic uh, pelvis. So again uh, patient usually come with, uh, comes with uh, chronic pelvic pain, uh, adhesive band obstruction. In this case, in this type of disease, uh, you have to do, you have to do thorough adhesial ICs, take biopsy according to the condition of the situation. So I will just uh, show two videos. So meanwhile, if you have any questions regarding diagnostic laparoscopy or any of the uh, previous talks, you can ask. <coughs> I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one.
এতক্ষণ নিল তো এটাই তো চলল somehow the pen drive is not getting accepted by the apple sir uh, i want to ask a question sir yeah, yeah. sir uh, uh, please suppose, introduce please yeah. introduce yourself sir my name is dr pratik i am from guwahati sir gwalior guwahati 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 yeah. assam sir sir uh, if uh, if we are going for a diagnostic laparoscopy what should be the uh, preferable uh, secondary port position sir uh, secondary port position sir it, it depends upon the uh, quadrant of the abdomen that you are going to inspect na so suppose you are uh, you have a gallbladder a suspected gallbladder malignancy and you want to see whether it's a metastatic gallbladder or something so first you do umbilical port and then uh, after putting the camera port you need to see so it's the, the way i have shown na the serial inspection of the abdomen then suppose you are seeing a nodule on the liver okay a gallbladder mass is there along with the nodule on the liver then you want to take a biopsy so you have to close place two work one or two working ports like that so that you can maintain the triangulation and all the working ports should be directing towards the target organ means if you are going to take a biopsy from the liver then the working port should be targeting towards the liver then if you are to take biopsy from the pelvis so you are need to if those working ports can be same with the same working ports you can do it but sometimes it very difficult to reach with the same working port over there if if it is necessary then you can <coughs> you can put a extra working port near the pelvis or below umbilicus then you can take biopsy so target organ should be there so target according to target number the tar- triangulation maintaining the triangulation of the laparoscopy you should uh, place your ports thanks আর আছে ঠিক আছে সো আই উইল শেয়ার দা ভিডিও ইন দা গ্রুপ ইন লেটার ইয়া টেল মি এডু মাইকটা মাইকটা দিয়ে দে শো গতো গুড ইভিনিং সো মাই সেলফ ডক্টর নিশিত फ्रॉम গুয়াহাটি আসাম স্যার সো সাম হাইলাইট অন অ্যাকিউট অ্যাবডোমেন সো ডায়াগনোস্টিক ল্যাপারোস্কোপি ইন অ্যাকিউট অ্যাবডোমেন কেসেস ওয়েন দি ডায়াগনোসিস ইজ নট সো ক্লিয়ার ইন সিটি অর সামথিং বাট অ্যাকিউট অ্যাবডোমেন ইজ देयर you want to proceed conservatively or surgical can we do diagnostic laparoscopy in yes, such cases definitely acute abdomen in any case situation suppose uh, you are suspecting some perforation yes, but sir. ideal location of the perforation yes, cannot not be identified not absolute perforation is not clear yeah we want to sometimes wait for 48 hours or something in that no, case no no there is see if you are suspect a patient you need to go by the clinical signs yes, if the patient is having tachycardia patient is having high temperature but the scans cannot identify the exact location of the pathology yes, then without wait, wasting much time you should go ahead with the laparoscopy if the till the patient's vitals are stable so if you keep this patient in the ward and wait for 24 hours but 48 hours suppose there is a small perforation yes, is sir. in the appendix or some small bubble Uh, then the uh, peritoneal contamination will keep on going so from chemical peritonitis to bacterial peritonitis to sepsis so patient condition will deteriorate so after maybe after two days the patient will be not that in ideal condition to go ahead with general anesthesia so will you may lose the patient that time one more thing sir uh, sup- uh, suppose in case of uh, peritonitis in sublating abdomen and doing the diagnostic laparoscopy is it advisable or there are any chances of mediastinitis or something like that mediastinitis due to the peritonitis or we are insufflating gases there is no inside. communication between the mediastinal cavity and the peritoneal no. cavity there is no chance of no such uh, no so only only thing is hemodynamics you need to see if the patient is too hypotensive yes sir so and you are inflating trying to inflate the abdomen na you will compress the, the intra abdominal pressure will compress the ivc again and there will be reduced cardiac output and patient may collapse on table in that situation you should no, go yeah so proper uh, pre operative hydration pre operative optimization is important as much as possible then you should discuss with your anesthesiologist then you can go ahead with the diagnosis thank you sir can i add a few points yeah yeah sure see whenever you get an acute abdomen no yes, sir. you have to use diagnostic laparoscopy as a part of the investigation rather than the treatment that's what i want to ask yeah so the, your question was very right so what he has answered is that if the patient is not too bad but can be taken up for the ot that is one thing okay but if he can take up in the ot just put a scope in and see there might be a non operative cause which will be proved in your diagnostic laparoscopy then you can take it out and do it absolutely that's what you have turned learned in gem right 
always put it in a scope and just see. So this was in uh, uh, MICCon 2023 when I had that difficult, uh, you know, ventral hernia, obstructive ventral hernia uh, session in which they showed pictures of very scary looking ventral hernias obstructed and uh, they kept asking me what will you do. So I kept on answering that I'll put in a scope and see. So most of the time, you know, you put in a scope and put in the gas, the hernia reduces by itself. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So always the better thing is to just put in a scope and see from a part of the abdomen which you know that there's nothing over there and as, uh, maintain the quadrant and the triangulation. So diagnostic laparoscopy in the world of advanced laparoscopy, diagnostic laparoscopy is often neglected. Yes. But it's, it's very important to know how to do a proper diagnostic laparoscopy. So you, you for the sake you are doing diagnostic laparoscopy and you, you, if you don't know how to inspect the abdomen, you may miss some finding. Even if you are doing diagnostic laparoscopy, you may miss the finding. So you need to know how to do proper diagnostic laparoscopy, properly take biopsies, send sample, how to do, uh, inspect, how to insp properly inspect the abdomen and go ahead with the findings actually. Acute intestinal obstruction. Subacute intestinal, yeah, yeah. So sometimes so there is band obstruction, subacute obstruction is there. If the medical causes of subacute, sometimes paralytic ileus is medical. So the medical causes are ruled out and you are suspecting some band adhesions or any other uh, pathology for which patient is having intermittent uh, uh, this bowel obstruction. So you can go ahead with the diagnostic laparoscopy. So would you go in with a varus or an open technique? If so you are suspecting it a depends. dilated bowel loop yeah. or maybe a… It know, depends on the condition of the bowel. Uh, see, if, if you can decompress the bowel, if the bowel is not that much dial dilated, if you decompress the bowel, can decompress it by putting Ryle's tube. You, if you are confident enough in putting uh, Viris needle or if you are suspecting some pathology in one part of the quadrant, you stay, you put a viris on the opposite quadrant of the opposite uh, quadrant. And if you are confident enough in putting the viris needle and if it, it, after putting it, if you are confident enough, it went in the right place in the peritoneal cavity without damaging the bowel. So you can go ahead with the inflating pneumoperitoneum. But if you find it difficult, then it is better to add, better to go ahead with the open uh, trocar technique. So you just stay layer by layer, you cut, you identify the peritoneum, make a small nick, then under vision you put the port. So that is more advisable in some if, if the bowel is too much dilated or if you are not sure enough where to put the first port like that. And to bookend this discussion about uh, diagnostic laparoscopy, don't forget this entity called mesenteric ischemia, which it gives mesenteric ischemia because it gives very uh, difficult clinical signs. So our scope is invaluable over there to see the color of the bowel and then decide. Okay. So thank you, Shumanto, for a wonderful talk as usual. Huh? So now we can proceed to the endo training, I think. Endo suturing and endo training. So some of you have tea and coffee, the rest. Are not.